So hello everyone, uh, welcome in uh, this session uh, devoted to um, uh, electric vehicles and uh, DRs. Um, I am Yannick Perez, I'm the, your moderator for uh, this session and I would be uh, very happy to, to moderate it because uh, EVs are one of my main interests in terms of research, so I'm very happy to, to hear what you, you are going to, to, to present and to participate to, uh, to the discussion, uh, but I hope we will have together. Uh, so I propose that the first speakers uh, uh, upload uh, his uh, presentation. Today we will have uh, four uh, presentations and uh, at the end of uh, each presentation, we will have time for, uh, for Q&A. So uh, I will ask you to, to present for 20 minutes sharp and then we will have time for, uh, for questions, okay? Okay, so let's Hi. go for uh, the first. Hi, I'm the first one. Uh, my name is Daria Ariel Maz, and I am joining from Boston today. Um, I'm an associate principal at Charles R. Associates. And um, today I'm going to talk about um, electric vehicle adoption along with distributed solar. Uh, and I will keep it in 20 minutes and see um, see how it goes. Uh, so this one of uh, my research papers, a colleague of mine from uh, Minnesota, uh, where I got the degree with, and she's now uh, an energy manager at Excel Energy. So uh, we recently developed this model. And um, the before I start, a lot of the information I present here um, is really both ours and does not really reflect um, our employer's opinion or, or perspectives. Um, and a lot of the results that I will present are going to be preliminary. Uh, the motivation for this study is that uh, we have both been working on distributed energy resource adoption in the United States specifically, and we see that uh, DERS, distributed energy resources, fundamentally changed the way um, electric grid works um, in the past 10 years. And the most significant change that we see is in the transformation on electricity consumption patterns on the consumer side. So a lot of the consumers um, before the DER adoption, uh, electricity consumers were more passive. Uh, now with all the distributed energy resources adoption, uh, consumers have become, become more active participants of the market. And in this paper, we've uh, focused on distributed solar at the residential level, and then uh, and then electric vehicles um, adoption. And the figure that I presented from a study uh, by Wang in 2018, just to illustrate uh, before and after um, uh, after daily load profiles. Uh, so the, the blue line that we have in the first chart, which is the peak day load uh, based on their study, is, is a lot more like there's peaking during the day, but after the, you know, DER adoption in general, you see um, a lot more different uh, peak load profile. And then you see that in a normal day load file as well, where you see um, a shift in, in demand. And in this study, what we will do is um, try to understand uh, how changing consumer preferences will affect the adoption of EV along with um, distributed solar, which, um, which will be um, a combination vehicle to go um, approach that I will talk about. So um, before I get into the model details, I would like to give you an overview of um, the current trends of distributed solar in the US and electric vehicles as we have a global uh, audience here. Uh, so in the US, uh, we have been seeing a significant adoption in distributed solar. And in the map, as you can see, the red, darker red um, shows um, there are regions that adopt solar very much, a lot of solar. And then there are regions that use there's little solar. But right now, about 30% of the distributed solar in the U.S. is, uh, is produced by small scale, um, such as the roof, rooftop installations. And these growths have increased 
more than seven times since 2010. So the last 10 years has been really significant for the adoption of, of this technology. And one of the reasons why we see this adoption increase is the cost of the technology has dropped significantly. Like if you look at the cost of the technology 10 years ago from charts below, um, there is a significant drop in, in the more than 60% decline in the cost of technology, which made um, solar more accessible to the customers. And then there are also policy incentives that cause, um, that not cause, but that stimulated uh, this fast growth um, in distributed solar. Uh, there are, uh, which I will talk about the key ones, there are uh, policies that subsidize solar directly uh, or alternative financing options where you don't need to own the solar, but leaving the solar panels through a third party would allow you to have um, your power come, a portion of your power come from um, solar. And the key uh, incentives uh, at the federal or the state level um, has been federal investment tax credits for solar um, gives approximately 30% of the initial in covers uh, approximately 30% of the initial investment cost. And um, this policy has been renewed several times. Um, and the amount of credits that get given towards uh, these investments have been declining over the years. However, and particularly for residential credit, they are set to expire in uh, 2023, but um, they have helped the integration or adoption of this um, technology quite a bit. And, uh, and next, there's uh, state net metering programs. Um, the way net metering programs work is if you're in a state where um, there is a net metering policy and you have a distributed solar on your roof, uh, when you generate uh, electricity, uh, instead of buying from the grid, if you can generate solar on your top, rooftop and you can use the amount that's needed for your own purpose, but the excess amount can be sold back to the grid and you are compensated by the utility that you are associated with in the, in the region uh, or the amount that you're producing. And that's uh, essentially the breadth of net metering policy. Uh, in, in, in the beginning of policy, so I think it was early 2010, uh, the policy gave the full credit, full retail rate of a kilowatt hour production of uh, electricity uh, from a, a solar panel. However, now uh, all, a lot of the states have been uh, considering to revise uh, this policy to apply some demand charges because there's been some cross substitution effects where uh, customers without solar panels have been uh, penalized indirectly by, uh, by the solar customers. So therefore, um, net metering policy have been a very important part of the system integration for these technology. Uh, however, um, uh, th there's been a lot of revisions in the, in the policy. And this map uh, really shows, this is a very recent map, uh, shows where there's, you know, there's a state developed mandatory net metering uh, regulation. And most of the states, as you can see in the US, dark blue ones have uh, a net metering policy. And, um, and, and there are, states where there's no mandatory net metering policy, but some utilities can offer alternative as an alternative incentive for the customers to adopt policy, adopt uh, solar. And, um, and, and Texas has the, um, their, their own um, supply distributed generation compensation rule. On the EV side, um, they are a small fraction of the total uh, commercial vehicle sales in the U.S. Um, and most of the time for this kind of technology, um, one of the key barriers is the cost and the available infrastructure um, to charge the, charge the vehicle. So uh, we saw a decline in, uh, in a lot of the EVs. Um, right now you can see um, like electric vehicles prices were ranging approximately 25 to 75K. Uh, and this, you know, there are new models, the Tesla produced the cheaper version. So there are alternatives 
more alternatives in the market uh, if you are really EV uh, pro EV person. Um, and so you you still have uh, see a decline in the cost of the technology, but um, but but still it's still a it's still a barrier. And then second biggest uh, barrier for for this adoption of technology is uh, is you can't really drive long miles with this car. I mean you can um, take your gasoline work gasoline vehicle and drive across the country and the uh, United States has a huge landscape as you know it, therefore going one place to another across the state is, is a huge mileage um, demand so therefore um, it's really difficult to um, uh, meet the uh, charging uh, needs and still uh, although there's been a huge improvement in in establishing charging infrastructure um, across the country, and especially in the um, in the west side of the country, we see still a lot of barriers for adopting um, EV due to uh, limited mileage opportunities uh, driving an electric vehicle over a conventional vehicle. Um, in order to, like, in terms of the uh, policies that would support uh, EV adoption, we still have a federal and state level, or even local, regional level offerings. But um, one of the uh, interesting offerings is is from the utilities, uh, which is so relevant to our studies. That utilities offer um, EV charging rates that um, motivates customers to charge during off peak hours and um, and so the electric grid is not overloaded when they are charging um, and there are a lot of state cash incentives for EV purchases as well um, and this chart uh, shows that um, different so this part of the chart is showing the different um, uh, big electric utilities and their tag hours and rates for uh, for charging EVs, their customers. And as you can see, uh, there is almost half uh, the off-peak off charging rate uh, for these customers, suggesting that you, know, you can charge your um, car half the price during off-peak hours con compared to on-peak hours. And, um, and that, that really stimulates our incentivizes customers, motivates customers to uh, move their charging activity to, um, to an off-peak period. Uh, another uh, interesting um, and very recent uh, approach that, uh, that increased over the past five years is a bundle of EV plus solar deployment. And there's a lot of opportunities with, if you are able to bundle EV plus solar, um, where pull, uh, we, we call it hybrid, uh, hybrid adoption. And this can have a number of benefits to the customers, as you know, uh, it's reduced demand bikes, um, so you don't overpay. And uh, there's also customer cost savings with all the offerings from the utilities alternative um, off-peak charging options. You can have um, a lot less bills. Uh, and then overall, some wide, you will see less pressure on grid. And uh, there are also issues that we've seen that if, if there's overcharging in a given region, then the grid is overloaded um, and there's like potential outages. So these can be avoided if um, a strategy for bundling EV and solar can be developed, and that um, that give a, give a, a lot of opportunity for both customers and and the market. And one of the key terms that is arise um, based on this bundling is the niche charging. And utilities have been concerned about how they can stimulate that. Uh, it's it's basically um, you know you are. Uh, as a utility, you are more concerned about where these charging locations are, like heavy charging locations are, and whether you can turn all on and all up or down. And 
if you can bundle EV and uh, solar and as well as or optimize uh, EV and solar bottle with the timing of charging and discharging, uh, then you will um, achieve a great result. So that's the theory that um, a lot of utilities have been concerned in the past five years to avoid a lot of system-wide impact and then customers would like to benefit from these technologies as much as possible. So a lot of the studies in the literature um, we have seen is, uh, you know, there have been a lot of optimization models and um, the, the modeling we focused on, you know, how uh, customer demand impacted. A lot of the studies that we have reviewed for this paper uh, suggest that modeling, you know, the impact of uh, adoption of this policy on customer demand, how the customer demand has shifted. And also there's been another line of uh, literature that looked at the relationship between adoption of electricals and solar. So uh, has been studied um, in a lot of ways. Um, and also empirically, there have been studies and I National uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory and Berkeley Lab have been one of the leading uh, research labs who have uh, done a lot of um, uh, surveys and, and with customers uh, on their EV and solar adoption and see what the revealed preferences show empirically um, the probability of adopting uh, electric vehicles um, and, and electric vehicle plus solar. And uh, this is more at the academic literature side and the industry side. Uh, we have seen a lot of um, industry studies focusing on the value of solar or value of um, you know, distributed energy resources type studies, mostly benefit cost analysis, integration with you know, um, from, from like an individual DER generator perspective, we see a lot of uh, these uh, models, uh, benefit cost analysis models developed to, um, to uh, value the solar um, as an asset and uh, an EV as an asset and how you can bundle them with some uncertainty introduced into the model. And in this paper, uh, given the review of the literature that we did, um, in this paper, we have uh, also developed an optimization model, which uh, has three components. Uh, the key thing that we model is what's the optimal EV and distributed solar adoption behavior of the customers. Uh, and there are three major components of, of the optimization framework, which I will not go through variable by variable, but I will try to, um, you know, give you the overview of framework. Um, and then I'm here to share the um, paper after the, after the session. Uh, so, Basically, the first uh, step of the or first component of the model is uh, looking at the hourly driving optimization, where we assume a utility function uh, optimizing the average miles um, for a customer <clears throat> for a given. Just you have two yep. minutes. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah, yeah, just a reminder: you have two minutes to conclude. So. Oh wow! Okay. Oh, it's been that much. Okay, sorry. Um, so, well, yeah, so that's the uh, hourly driving uh, optimization portion, and then uh, which is maximizing the utility for a customer uh, to that, that it's um, customer's optimal decision to purchase EV, electric vehicle, conventional vehicle, or um, the bundle, EV plus distributed solar. And the key tariffs that we consider in modeling the simulation is net metering policy, the time of use, it's not like a straight retail rate, and then uh, demand charges. And uh, the differentiator of our model is we assume that uh, the consumers have varying driving preferences. And then we run a bunch of sensitivity tests based on changes in the uh, policy incentives, specifically net metering policy, technology cost, and on versus off-peak charging. So the second, comp the first component, we optimize the consumer's driving preferences. The second portion, we optimize solar investment decision. And then the third, we see whether vehicle adoption optimization can be bundled 
uh, given the policy and and the uh, the, the um, electricity price picture. So, in other words, the choice is made between choosing between conventional vehicle, electric vehicle, or uh, electric vehicle and solar. And uh, we have developed some uh, mileage uh, profile given the National House Travel Survey data, and then we also uh, uh, developed a simulated uh, electricity production from a solar panel that's 65 kilowatt uh, from the radiation data uh, in Arizona, where we see a lot of sunlight. Um, since I don't have a lot of time to show you um, uh, too many results, uh, I can maybe go through some of the uh, decision outcomes that we have um, obtained based on the uh, model input. Um, what we see in the uh, the upper right is is the net present value. So we compare the net present value of um, uh, of a consumer's preference given their choice. And when we see that alpha, which is the customer's um, utility, uh, customer's mileage, uh, we see with the higher mileages uh, that consumer would choose conventional vehicle. And then when the alpha is in the middle range, we see a lot more uh, EV uh, choice. And then during on-peak and off-peak hours, uh, optimal miles driven are highest among uh, between, uh, consumers between alpha between 0.2 and 0.4, meaning that consumers that are in the middle range uh, that will choose a EV over conventional vehicles. However, there's always a trade-off between increased satisfaction, energy costs, and, and, um, and making the choice between the uh, vehicle decisions. We um, see that you really have 30 seconds to conclude, otherwise we will have no time for Q&A. So you can consume um, your time, but uh, after there will be no question. OK, so then maybe I should just uh, go into the implications of the study where um, how you can use this model. Uh, practical implications is uh, you can uh, bundle E if there are the right policies. Uh, and we have done some simulations, try to show how this bundling would affect, uh, would affect the, uh, the net uh, electricity consumption. So we, uh, with the right level of incentives to shift the load that can coincide with solar generation, uh, it's very possible to achieve very low net load where uh, in the graphs you can see that most of the charging can be a map to solar generation, which would create a zero, almost zero uh, load that would have uh, benefited the customer the most and the, um, the, uh, the system the most. And in order to achieve that, you need to have the right charging uh, policy and the right intent to stimulate customers um, uh, to uh, charge their uh, vehicles during the right times of the day. So it's re policy driven behavior where customers choose this kind of technology as a conclusion. Hopefully I was able to conclude in 30 seconds, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, as you might have. Thank you. Um, so is there uh, questions coming from um, the other speakers or the attendees? I have a question uh, about slide number nine. Yep. Could you explain a bit more uh, the, the equation first? This is, a, I guess, utility function. Yes. And alpha means like at the level of risk aversion. How I should understand this equation? Um, sure. Alpha is, uh, so, Basically, X is the mile driven. So that's the utility function of the cu customer I, uh, where X is the uh, mile driven and alpha is the preferences of driving. And it's a value between zero and one ranges, whether your preferences in this range. And this basically gives you an opportunity to 
define heterogeneous um, preferences for driving as final mileage. Okay, so, so it has nothing to do. Goes, oh, sorry, as alpha goes uh, uh, up, you are you are enjoying the vehicle a lot more, but also it's constrained by the cost uh, in the optimization. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, is there another question? Okay. Um, I have uh, a couple, well, let's say, I, I have some questions because uh, it's, uh, I have a couple of students which are uh, working on the, um, closely related topics, uh, trying to run simulation models for uh, trying to see the compatibility of uh, EVs and, uh, and PVs in California, for instance, um, and try to, to, to assess what is the best tariff design to, uh, to have um, at the same time a net present value for the investor, uh, but also to save um, unnecessary investment for the DSO. Uh, yeah. And at the same time uh, to, uh, let's say, to, to have um, the, the, the right incentive to develop uh, both technologies. Uh, because uh, if you have um, two policies, one for EV and one for, uh, for solar, um, you have to manage the fact that on, on the tariff design, they are producing uh, strictly opposite effects. And uh, one could uh, overpass uh, <laughs> The, um, the issue of the other, so you have to calibrate quite efficiently the, the system in order to, to have an efficient one and not, um, let's say, um, ne negative externalities uh, through the tariff design on the, or the profitability or the cost for society or the cost for, um, for the networks. So I, I really like the, the, the way you, you, you address this, um, this important question. The only thing which seems to me missing in, in your presentation is, um, is, is the reaction function of the regulatory commission. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you, usually when, uh, when the regulatory commission sees uh, that the tariff that did not help to recover the cost, they are usually quite upset. Uh, and uh, they changed the tariff, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, because they want the DSOs to cover that fixed cost, which is basically the aim of the regulation. So I think you, you, somewhere in your um, in your study, you, you should put some uh, some regulatory balance or some regulatory uh, action. Uh, when you go too far in one direction, then the regulator will change something in order to try to fix the, the issue. And in California, for instance, they are saying that uh, probably submetering for uh, uh, EVs uh, could be a solution to uh, countervail uh, the, the negative effects of the combination of EVs and PVs uh, to have a, a strict measure of what the EV is doing and probably to change the tariff only for EVs consumption in uh, the package of the EV uh, for uh, for the customers. Uh, so so I don't know if you want to to go on, on that direction, but I think it would be uh, um, would be interesting for you to um, or to say that you are not going to do it for X and Y reason. Complexity is usually the <laughs> the main reason. <laughs> not to look at uh, the the reaction function of the of the regulatory commission because it makes the system. Uh, quite uh, quite complex to handle complex, yeah. uh, or uh, or uh, other type of, of reason that you could imagine than not to do it but otherwise your your uh, your, your model uh, have the risk of um, going too far in a direction that at the end uh, it will have been prevented by regulatory decision saying no uh, if we see that the DSO goes to bankruptcy we are not going to wait until the back bankruptcy happens. If, uh, if he, we see that he is loses $10 million, we are going to stop before bankruptcy, let's say. Yeah. So probably um, try to find signals or thresholds in which that if you reach this threshold, then uh, you, you say that the system will block because it will be uh, somehow re-regulated. 
Yeah. Okay. So I guess what you're suggesting is that at, at when 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 adoption or when the customer reached certain point in their utility or in their uh, miling uh, driving preference in terms of mileage, they should be capped with some endogenous regulatory barrier yep. based on. Yeah, our model right now is endogenously incorporating um, the incentives that already exist, and we do a sensitivity around that. That's a, that's a great suggestion um, that we should definitely look into since we are in the preliminary stage in the uh, simulation. So thank you very much for the suggestion. Thank you. Uh, so we are at the end of the, of the time for the first paper. So we are going to move to the second, but uh, I think your paper deserve uh, a round of applause. So at least you have more. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, second uh, sec second speaker, could you upload your um, your presentation, please? Is there a technical problem, Mohamed? Are you with us? Yes, yes, hello, I'm here. I will just, uh, just share my screen. Perfect. We yeah. see it we see it full screen perfectly. Thank you. Okay, uh, so hello everybody, uh, I'm Saad El Arab. I'm a PhD student at uh, Centre de Science Scientifique at Ecole des Mines, and I will present uh, my uh, research about the energy management systems, uh, EMS, uh, for operations in, in microgrids, uh, including uh, V2H and V2G uh, energy services. Uh, energy services. Uh, Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, we know that we all know that the present energy demand and the environmental crisis uh, have uh, have been promoting the rapid development of uh, of EVs and also the the, the renewable energy, including uh, the the solar uh, PV and uh, and the wind power. Uh, however, uh, this EV charging activities and uh, the renewable energy generation are always uh, intermittent and if uh, uncontrolled uh, a significant impact uh, on the power grid uh, may happen uh, including uh, over generation uh, especially when a larger scale of distributed generation uh, uh, units and EVs are used. So the main idea uh, is, to rec is reconciling the EVs and the renewable energy to ensure this optimal usage of, uh, of electric power uh, and uh, to perform uh, and enhance the economy of smart grids and microgrids. Uh, so aside from energy storage devices as, uh, as the normal batteries and home batteries, uh, we have seen uh, the introduction of the, the PEVs, the plug-in electric vehicles, uh, which can play a major role in smoothing out these uh, intermittent uh, renewables. Uh, and this, uh, this, uh, these PEVs are uh, uh, are mobile and can de deliver the energy back to the power grid and allow a different uh, type of uh, energy services uh, such as uh, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, uh, and also home to vehicle and and, and works. But to to manage uh, this this uh, energy services uh, and to and to uh, manage uh, and to manage this smartness, we have to add this this layer of smartness, which is the energy management system. Uh, which play a key role in uh, operating microgrids uh, and cover the supply and demand side management uh, to realize uh, the economical uh, and ensure the operation of microgrids while satisfying uh, different constraints, uh, operational, environmental, and also uh, and also technical. Uh, so this research is aims to develop a home energy management system uh, to optimize. Uh, and design an optimal schedule of, uh, of, uh, of a nanogrid actually, uh, which is a smart home, 
considering vehicle to grid and vehicle to home energy services. And the, the developed method will uh, allow us to, to identify the, the, the potential energy cost uh, and also to compare uh, the effectiveness of vehicle to grid uh, and vehicle to home with uh, strategies in the case uh, when uh, we don't use uh, we don't use uh, the electric vehicle with just uh, the, the the battery home battery. Uh, and before that, just to uh, uh, to define the vehicle to grid, uh, it's uh, it's it's the vehicle to grid control uh, the vehicle charging and returns the electricity to to the grid. Uh, and the vehicle to home or to vehicle to build the building uh, acts as a supplement power suppliers to to the home. But we we have also the V1G, which is in, in unidirectional uh, control charging, uh, when where vehicles uh, infra infrastructure adjust the rate uh, of of charging. Uh, so for this research, we will consider uh, a domestic grid connected standalone nano grid. Actually, we had different type of, uh, of uh, microgrid topology. We have the centralized one, the distributed one, but we will uh, we will uh, focus on uh, on a standalone nanogrids or, or standalone uh, smart homes uh, equipped with a, a photovoltaic PV array as a renewable energy source and a home battery or a PV battery uh, because the aim is to to compare them. And the proposed uh, home energy management system is to minimize the consumer's expected power cost uh, under some uh, technical constraints. Uh, yeah. So uh, the architecture of our home energy management system, the global architecture, it's that uh, our home energy management system in, uh, in, uh, in the center of the, 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 the graph here uh, will, will act uh, and we we'll design an optimal uh, uh, optimal energy energy flow uh, to uh, to manage the stochasticity and the randomness of the PV arrives and uh, and load uh, demand, which are our uh, random variables. Uh, and the power grid, uh, the P grid, will act as a uh, as a recourse variable if we if we uh, take this problem as a stochastic one. Uh, and uh, the the PV battery and the uh, and the uh, and home battery uh, are our control variables. Uh, we will use them to uh, to manage uh, to manage the and to design the optimal energy flow. Uh, so the first case uh, it's uh, to design a home energy management system uh, with a PV and a battery, a normal battery. Uh, and uh, the power balance equation of the smart home will be uh, uh, this one uh, discretized, discretized in a uh, discretized time horizon with the P grid equal to the P to P the P, P battery uh, plus the load uh, minus uh, what we have uh, product uh, product as as uh, as PV uh, production. Uh, and for this first case, uh, we will uh, we will we will uh, we will take uh, we will apply a deep learning uh, for time series forecasting uh, to uh, to forecast the home load curve uh, time series, the weather data, and also the PV uh, the PV production. Uh, actually, in in this uh, in this uh, research, we assume uh, uh, this uh, this variable uh, as a deterministic. Since we, they are uh, forecasted and uh, they are incorpor incorporated to the stochastic uh, control uh, when we uh, minimize the, the expected value of the sum of, uh, of, the, of the, the price of the electricity at its time t uh, uh, and, uh, and the, the sum of our production, uh, our pro production and what we have consumed. And we use time variant electricity prices. And the module, uh, the time series forecasting module, uh, we use machine learning and uh, EDSTM based uh, neural network with various configuration to construct uh, our forecasting models uh, and to forecast the load curve, the, the consumption load curve, and the weather data, and also the, the PV, the PV production. And uh, this is for uh, for the first uh, for the first case. The second case, uh, it's uh, 
the second case it's when we 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 have uh, the PV uh, the same uh, the same uh, configuration but uh, as a control variable we we have uh, the PV battery and the challenge to manage this PV battery that uh, it's that we 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 have uh, uh, two uh, real uh, real uh, random variables which are pv and low demand and our control variable actually uh, is also uh, uh, is also uh, stochastic because uh, we have to manage uh, we have to manage the randomness of the plugin and plug out uh, on, on on the home uh, and uh, the power balance equation uh, will be uh, X, we, we will modify the the p bat the home battery with the xt uh, by uh, p ppv uh, which is the soak of the of the battery and uh, the idea here is that this boolean this xt uh, denotes the pv states uh, when it's plugged in or plugged out uh, and to capture this behavior and this dynamics uh, we will use uh, the, the Markov chain uh, actually, uh, and uh, we will use also first. Well, we will use the same modules as this as the first one for forecasting uh, our random variables and to to manage uh, 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 to manage a deterministic problem. And for the stochasticity or randomness of the P plugin and plugout, we will uh, we will catch this dynamic using Markov chain. Uh, and for that, uh, we, uncor we un incorporate uh, the XT variable uh, by catching the dynamic of the random process of the dry hair be behavior uh, by uh, catching the uh, by catching the behavior of uh, the transition states between the the state of uh, where where the uh, where the, the 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 EV is connected to the home. Uh, and uh, and the, the and the state state where the the EV is not co connected, and also uh, the the uh, the constant state where uh, the, the the PV stay uh, connected or not connected. And uh, as a, as a result uh, of, uh, of 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 this work, uh, as a result of this work, uh, we have developed the stochastic controller uh to 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 do the optimal scheduling and bring significant cost saving uh using this v2g and v2h energy services and we have uh, used the uh, actually not real data but uh, generated data uh, for a whole year uh, and the result is that the total electric cost uh, when we use the bidirectional uh, v2h mode and the v2h mode when uh, when the home battery uh, charge the vehicle and also the vehicle can charge the home battery uh, is 3.1 lower uh, in cost than in the unidirectional mode when uh, when just the home uh, battery charge the 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 the, 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 the EV and uh, the total uh, electric cost is 71.3 less for the vehicle to grid uh, mode in comparison to the case without the EV uh, uh, and the total electric cost is lower by 14.9 percent in the V2H mode and 7.2 uh, uh, mode uh, more for the grid to vehicle in comparison to the case without uh, without the EV uh, uh, and here, it's, uh, this this work is just a first step. Actually, uh, when we when we have designed and implemented the first uh, the home energy management system of a standalone uh, nano grid, but the main idea is to have a bottom up approach and uh, and use uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this home energy management system as uh, individual agents uh, to test. Uh, the off-grid case, which is an, uh, the aggregation of uh, of uh, of this uh, standalone nanogrids, and also the micro the urban microgrid case, uh, which is the uh, the grid connected case and uh, of the uh, of this and uh, the aggregation of these nanogrids, and also here we have uh, as a, in the in the cost function function, we have uh, used the the dynamic tariff. But we can also use this uh, as an approach to test different types of uh, of, uh, of policies. Thank you. If we have a question.
Thank you very much, uh, Mohamed, for your brilliant uh, presentation. I really, really like it very much. Um, I will let uh, questions uh, or comments coming from uh, the, the audience first, and then, of course, I will, uh, I will give you some, uh, some comments. Thank you. Uh, is there some, some questions coming from the audience? Ah, there's a question, but you you could you could speak it speak it loud. Huh? There is no uh, there is no problem. Uh. Okay, thank you, thank you. So thank you for your uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. So if you can, uh, could you please uh, tell us uh, some words about the stochastic algorithm uh, you used and its limits? And also, if you can just ask my second question, which is how did you manage the randomness of OEC arrivals? So thank you for your answer in advance. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I mentioned uh, a stochastic control, but uh, in fact, I used the stochastic dynamic programming, uh, which is uh, the, the application of uh, of uh, dynamic programming in a stochastic, uh, in, and, and we take into account the stochastic uh, variables. Uh, and it limits that uh, we have uh, a curse of dimensionality, actually. We cannot uh, exceed uh, two or three uh, control variables, uh, but we have also uh, other works who manage this, uh, these limits using uh, SDDP, stochastic dual dynamic programming. Uh, or uh, uh, to, to to manage this uh, this stochastic, stochasticity and these limits of the of, uh, course of dimensionality. And the second question is uh, how did I manage the uh, did I manage the, uh, uh, the 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 EV arrival? Is that correct? Yeah, the randomness of uh, of PVR. Yeah, for the randomness of uh, of the plugin and plugout, like I said, I used the uh, Markov chains uh, to uh, to to uh, extract the, the 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 stochastic matrix, the the transition matrix that we, we will use uh, on the on the SDP uh, to uh, to the to op to detect and to uh, design the optimal uh, the optimal policy of. Uh, of, of, uh, of the power flow. Okay, um, is there other questions? No, George or no, question, no more questions? Uh, okay, Mohamed. Um, I, I think your 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 approach is um, is very uh, interesting and um, and goes in, uh, in in a place where there is few research. And I think it's a very good idea to to, to address these uh, these questions in the in the way you do it. Um, I, I have uh, roughly two questions. Uh, the first one is. Uh, um you, you in fact basically your approach is to build your own data through simulations and then to 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 let the, your model learns about the data he has on produced to improve the the solutions i'm correct if i yeah, okay. it, uh, the, the way like that um did, did you could you find some real data to see if the uh, the model is learning uh, something that is, uh, let's say, closely related with uh, with data that you could extract from uh, uh, from other sources to to see if your calibration makes sense. Exactly, exactly. that's the that's the main uh, next uh, next step. Actually, I, I I get some data from a from a demonstrator on on Greece, uh, and uh, I work on that to calibrate uh, to calibrate my my models. Uh, especially the forecasting uh, module, uh, and also the, uh, the to, to catch the behavior of the EVs, uh, plug in and plug out. Uh, but uh, I have uh, I have not a a big uh, big difference between between the, the two. Actually, I have yes, I have more randomness, but uh, it uh, actually it's managed by the by, by the SDP, but. Uh, the, the, the model the, the model uh, acts good actually 
Okay. Then, because um, uh, after the conference, we could discuss because we have um, uh, some data, not a lot, but quite 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 more than that uh, to for real driving behaviors, uh, PV productions and stuff like that. That we could provide it to you if you want to uh, to make the calibration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With pleasure. Uh, actually, I, I used uh, some. Uh, the problem is that I used real data from. Uh, from uh, from Greece and uh, I used an open data of EVs from another country, which make actually uh, not a, a convergence of results. So yes. if you have data from the same place, actually it will be very good. So thank you for so, that. Uh, so we, we could exchange on that. I think it, it would make sense. And then I have a second question, uh, no question or remark, I don't know. Um, is uh, is regarding the scalability uh, because if you go from in fact usually with models we we have uh, let's say um, a certain number of things we could put in and in a certain moment the, we have to stop because it's not tractable yeah. anymore and i was wondering with your approach how many um if you start by a, a household uh, what is the maximum number of household, uh, complex households that you could put in the model before it, it becomes crazy? Uh, it could be uh, 10, 10, 20, 100, 1,000, 10,000, or you don't know. I, I think theoretically it's 30, 30. Okay. Yeah. So 30, uh, it's, uh, it's a real uh, district. So exactly. So we'll listen. We could make the modelization uh, for a district. Then uh, we have also other models uh, that could help you because um, with 30, with a district, in fact, you have a transformer issue and uh, you could uh, increase the lifetime of the transformer if you, uh, uh, if you guarantee that you will not overload the transformer and it has a yeah. great, great value. Uh, I don't know if you attend the... Um, the Michael Caraman is yesterday um, speech where basically he says with DSOs the, the biggest problem is not to overload the mm -hmm. uh, the transformer and with thirty um, with thirty houses uncontrolled versus controlled uh, you could prove that you have a, a very huge impact on the lifetime of the one of the main components of the uh, of the DSO uh, uh, equipment. Okay. okay. So uh, I think you could also check how to to combine your results uh, with, uh, let's say, transformer um, issues. Okay, of course, I will take that into account. Thank you for your remark. My pleasure. Uh, then is there other comments or questions? Or do we move to the uh, third uh, uh, presentation for uh, from uh, Jip Kim? Okay, no other presentation. So, uh, really, congratulations, uh, Mohamed, and I, I really um, invite you to to send me emails uh, for uh, further interactions. Uh, I think we have a lot of um, of good things to do uh, and to help you to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Congrats. Okay, Jeep. Uh, we didn't hear you. Yeah, do you see my screen well? Yes, we see the screen perfectly well. All right, great. Uh, all right, let's get started then. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Uh, my name is Chip Kim. I recently actually graduated two weeks ago from NYU, and I'm currently a postdoc at Columbia University in the city of New York. But today, I'm going to present the work that I did uh, with the team at NYU. So uh, yeah, the topic is towards information and work policy making on DR remuneration. And this particular work was supported by the Sloan Foundation and NSF. All right, uh, let's start with the background. So in the United States, um, like there are multiple states um, and each state government, they're aiming to achieve uh, individual renewable goals. And uh, usually they're in the form of the RPS goal. And for example, the, in the state of Washington, they have like 15 by 2020 and they updated that to 100% by 2045. In Texas, like they have the capacity goal and some states have uh, you know, the resource specific goals as well. Um, but however, 
in terms of the market, actually multiple markets, they are operated over the multiple states. So for example, in case of the ISO New England market, multiple states, like six states are tied into a single wholesale RPS market. And while each state has an individual RPS goal, which gives uh, complexity in terms of both economics and engineering, because like uh, when you solve the powerful equation, of course, you have to account for the circumstances in the multiple states. And when you solve the market problem, you have to account for the multiple policies within the multiple states. And also, um, there's another challenge in terms of the power, um, power system planning and then the, the tariff design, um, because there are multiple stakeholders within the single electricity market, for example, the, and there are conflicts of those interests. For example, regulator wants to maximize their social welfare while achieving their own RPS goal. And power utility and generation companies, they usually maximize their profit. And consumer, they need to maximize their surplus. So the, 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 the challenge from the regulator is to balance the perspective of the multiple stakeholders while, while they implement their own policy. All right. All right, another challenge is related to the information asymmetry in general information problem. And some actually a lot of um, the, the tools, decision-making tools of the regulator, they assume the perfect knowledge of every single information oftentimes. However, that is not the case. Um, usually, for example, the future policy can be a random variable from the perspective of the power utility or generation company. And also the usually transmission network and distribution network, of course, the situation in the distribution network is worse in terms of the, the knowledge to the, um, the topology of the system. And uh, if you don't know exactly about the topology, then it's really hard to predict the value of your resources in your location. So in this sense, the investors are exposed to certain um, profit risks because of this information problem. And in case of the relationship between the consumer and power utility, consumer preference um, is a secure information. And oftentimes, even consumer themselves, they cannot know exactly about their um, preference and demand profile. And general, like those information challenges are very, um, very common in uh, planning models and the regulatory decision making. So here's a, here's a graph that I took from the Hobbes et al. Um, so this is the current practice of the usually uh, regulators um, planning model or policy making model. As I said, to summarize the challenges, like uh, usually they take the universal policy throughout all the, all the states and which does not account for the regional diversity. And also it does not account for the conflicting interests of the multiple stakeholders. And also they often assume all the policy decisions are made and they set them as a parameter rather than optimize them. Also, again, the perfect knowledge is assumed for policy planning and operation conditions and et cetera. And part of the reason why they didn't I mean, account for those, those elements is because the existing um, solution techniques and the existing solvers they cannot handle the multi-level or the equilibrium models that well. So to, to overcome such challenges, uh, we've been working on this type of uh, regulatory planning model for a while, and we already published two papers. The first one is related to the equilibrium model among the comp about the competitions among multiple states. And the second item is about the how to optimize the um, RES incentives while they account for the conflict interests of the multiple stakeholders. And the last piece is the toward information or policy making. This is the piece that I'm going to present today. And the idea is that we want to know what is the value of information in decision making in terms of the regulatory decision making. Um, to do so, actually, we developed the perfect foresight and imperfect foresight models on the year information and while taking the perspective of the state regulator. And for the imperfect foresight model, we uh, adopted a risk-informed optimization using a current risk measure, conditional value risk. And we compare our results for when, uh, in case when we have the, all the perfect foresight and the case when we don't have the perfect foresight. So there's some error in their uh, prediction on the deterioration, right? 
So this is the simplified illustration of the transmission distribution network. Of course, like we're not gonna use this um, three bus system to represent the realistic system. However, this is just a pure illustration. So we consider uh, one transmission zone and uh, the connecting distribution network. And we assume that the wholesale electricity market is cleared first, and then the distribution level marketplace is cleared later on. So it's more of a sequential clearing. Um, of course, like in the literature, some literature considering simultaneous clearing of the both TND markets. Um, however, we thought like uh, this sequential clearing would be more realistic in the future. Okay, so we consider three different zero remuneration policies. The first one is the net energy metering, which is you know the the legacy approach, like uh, where you get compensated exactly at the same value to the. Um, consumer tariff. Oftentimes, you put the um, the the parameter alpha to adjust the, how much you're gonna. The, this value will be proportional to the consumer tariff, but usually, oftentimes, their their the value is one. And value stack tariff. Uh, this is actually the approach that the state of New York. I mean, like the the, the New York State uh, adopted. And the, the, what value stack is that they compensate at a rate reflecting their energy value, environmental value, and avoided capacity value. Like depending on the jurisdiction, there can be more multiple components. However, in here, if you take a look at the equation, um, the set IR, uh, probably you don't see my cursor yet. Um, all right. Yeah, for the renewable energy resources, there are three components. The first one is LMP, and the second one is the environmental value, and the third one is the avoided capacity value. In case of the controllable resources, which is uh, emitting resources like uh, you know, coal or oil generator, they don't get compensated for the environmental value. So that's that's why you miss one term here. So they discretize the, the tariff into two different policies, um, two different elements, and uh, they compensate it based on these values. And then the DRMP based remuneration might be probably the most aggressive approach in a sense that they get compensated at a marginal cost of the DLMP. Oftentimes, like uh, this is the this is set as a dual variable of the power balance equation in the distribution level optimal power flow equation, or some market can adopt the economic dispatch to set this price as well. However, we assume that we solve the optimal power flow for, for, for this value. So in this case, of course, like uh, uh, the DLMP can account for the energy loss, voltage regulation, and congestion values. Of, of course, like it depends on the, what type of DLMP model you adopt, um, but it, it will be a decision of the, the juris each jurisdiction rather than the modeling um, selection. All right, so here's, a, here's our model framework. Um, there are five um, components and each component is modeled as a, um, each optimization problem. So essentially this multi-level multi model will be a multi-level optimization. Um, the, first, the first problem is the state regulators problem, uh, which decides the tariff for the consumer and DER. And it decides the surcharge uh, for the RES incentives uh, to um, how do I, to secure the budget for the RES incentive, and they also optimize the RES incentive design. Um, actually, in the yeah in the figure, I I draw I drew all the elements like pi dr is the the tariff for the dr, and the tau e is RES incentive energy based incentive, and tau c is a capacity based incentive. And here, uh, pi C is consumer tariff and S is the consumer surcharge. However, in, later in our simulation, we, use, we only implemented the, the energy-based incentive rather than like having them both just, to, just for the sake of the modeling complexity. And the second, second model is the strategic resource investor, which is located right here. Um, they decide their expansion decision and while they offer to the um, power utility and wholesale electricity market. Again, like it really depends on how you design your TND system. If the power utility solves just a, you know, the cost minimization problem, then of course they're gonna offer like this. And if the power utility or, or if the policy is just net metering, then of course like the, whatever they're offering from the strategic resource investor will be accepted uh, from the power utility and they're gonna get compensated. So essentially dispatch will be equal to the offer. 
And in the third problem, we have consumer here. Um, consumer, they maximize their surplus while they change their flexible demand, like uh, as a response to the tariff and surcharge. Like if the tariff is, is high, then of course they're they will try to reduce their consumption. On the other hand, if the tariff is low, then of course they can increase a little bit so that they can they have um, they make more advantage out of it. And the fourth problem is the power utility. Again, power utility is assumed to operate the distribution system and the distribution level marketplace simultaneously. And the way they operate the distribution market um, can be set differently depending on your remuneration policy. And lastly, uh, the least interesting component is the wholesale electricity market. They just clear the market while solving the social offer maximization or cost minimization while they generate they make the generation dispatch decision. Of course, as a as a market outcome, you get to have LMP, a dual variable of the power balance equation in the wholesale stress market. Okay. All right. And uh, since I cannot explain or you know, explain all single component of the optimization. I brought the summarized um, table for each optimization problem. And I actually already explained most of them. Um, uh, so state regulator maximize their social effort while having their decision and their constraints are the renewable support budget, RPS requirement, and the your revenue adequacy because the, the state regulator don't want to let the DR aggregator or other investors to be exposed to the the revenue um, deficit. Um, and the, by doing so, they can optimize the RES incentive or consumer tariff or DR tariff um, correctly. And the state uh, strategic resource investor, they, they make the generation expansion decisions while their constraint is generation offered to the TND market, generation output limits, and regional supply demand balance. And then the TND market is. Uh, is quite typical. Uh, for the transmission level, uh, we use the DC approximation of the power flow equation. And for the distribution level, we use the Lindis flow approximation of the uh, AC power flow. And the rest of the constraints are quite typical. All right. Okay. So, um, in case of uh, so the there can be multiple information on availability for each component and among them we wanted to tackle uh, one component first the, fir the 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 component is actually the dr remuneration which is denoted as the pi dr here and depending on the policy we're considering three policies right net metering value stack and deal deal phase remuneration from the state regulator's perspective, there's not much you can do about the DLMP based remuneration because uh, the DLMP is an outcome of the power flow equation and there's nothing you can do about it. However, in case of the net metering and Bellistec, Bellistec tariff, you can optimize the, this pi DL value directly for, uh, from, from the state regulator's perspective and set it, right? Um, so there are some um, information problem in the, the, the value stack tariff and the LNP based remuneration, because if you are an investor, then you, of course, you want to know exactly how much pi DR will be, how much your remuneration will be once you make your investment. However, this is an uncertain information because you can predict, predict the future accurately, there is always an error. So therefore we impose an uncertainty into, in, in LNP component and then the fixed avoided cost in case of bail tariff. And in case of the DLMP based remuneration, we assume that the, the DLMP itself is a random variable if you don't know exactly about it. So in case of the imperfect foresight model, um, instead of solving deterministic optimization, we solve the risk informed C bar optimization using the value um, conditional better risk instead. And one benefit of the conditional value risk is that if you assume to follow, if you assume your random variable to follow a normal distribution, actually you can reformulate them into a deterministic form, as you can see here. So when the C var is smaller than D, then actually it can be written like a, as a, a, using the average and value risk. And if you know the your distribution, like so that you know the the inverse of the your your PDF, then actually uh, you can. Using that quantile function, um, the this equation can be rewritten in a deterministic form like this. So we adopt this solution technique, 
And since we have this multi-level structure, there's nothing you can do about it. You can you cannot throw that um, whole junk into an optimizer solver because the all the existing optimizer solvers they just accept the single level problem. So you have to either um, develop or convert the problem into a single level problem or solve them using some sort of algorithm. So our solution technique kind of adopts both of them. So the first step is we apply the strong duality to the P1 problem so that the problem can be a single level here. And then again, since this problem is um, convex again, um, so we apply another strong duality here so that we adopt, uh, we obtain an L3 problem. However, this L3 problem is a quadratic programming problem, which is not essentially convex. So you cannot apply the strong duality anymore or KKK condition here. So therefore we um, develop the column and cut generation algorithm, which is essentially the decomposition algorithm using a horizontal cut. I'm not gonna go detail into the solution technique because I'm running out of time, I, I guess, um, yeah. So yeah, so this is the conversion of the each step and this is the column and cut algorithm. So the basic, just the basic idea is that uh, when you, when you, if you solve the sub problem first and then let the master problem knows about the behavior of the sub problem by adding another constraint every iteration. By doing so, the master problem understand the sub problem a little bit better, better over again, over the iterations. So that at the end of the day, the master problem will choose the same problem while the sub problem decisions are implemented directly to the master problem. So yeah, and here's a case study. We use the PND network, um, the New York State, uh, New York ISO system as a wholesale electricity market system. And we use the seven bus Manhattan system as a distribution network. And uh, we assume that each node has each um, dual uh, variable. I mean, of course, like they're gonna have dual variable. I mean, like they're, those, the seven points will be uh, uh, the proxy of the, each region. And because the quadratic program problem is not essentially a convex problem, so we had to use a nonlinear optimization solver. Well, so we used a nitro and we actually adopted uh, um, what's that uh, multi starting point algorithm because uh, the, non the one downside of the nonlinear solver is not they are not guaranteed to achieve, achieve global optimum. So instead, what we did is we allocated 300 different starting points and each point achieve a local optimum and then we select the best out of the 300. So that's that's what we did. We implement everything on the Julia. And this is since the problem is very complex, com complex so we ran on the high performing resources at NYU. All right, here's the results. So first of all, the investment decisions of the strategic uh, resource investor, uh, so essentially there are like 12 results in this simple plot. So you see net metering and value step, DLMP, three different policies, and you see 40%, 50%, 60%, 70%. So those are the parameters like, uh, so essentially if you have a 40% RKS goal, you get the first, first result. And if you have a 70%, then you get this result. Right, and the investment decisions for the 40 and 50% RPS goals are almost identical if you compare these two, while the 60% and 70% RPS goals yields more renewable resources insulation. However, uh, the social welfare resulting from the, these um, investments, um, like the more aggressive RES goals resulted, uh, resulted in a decreased social welfare. This is because the RES incentives and consumer surcharge to compensate such investments um, had to be um, increased as well. Uh, you can find more about that here. So uh, this is this shows the regulatory decisions here. First of all, uh, what you can notice here is that the pi dr expected value, the the DLMP achieved the lowest um, pi dr, meaning like uh, you will get compensated at the lowest value in case of the DLMP base. Um, policy, while the net metering and value stack, they achieve relatively higher value than that. Um, by the way, the horizontal value is just RPS goals. And in case of the, in case of the more aggressive um, RES goals, actually uh, the, the RES incentive has to be set higher to compensate the additional renewable um, installations. And to secure a budget for those RS incentives, uh, you need, the regulator has no option but to increase the search, consumer surcharge here as well. Right. And another interesting point is that, uh, so this is the 
objective function of the state regulator, the global social welfare. The, an interesting point is that the DLMP based approach achieves the highest um, social welfare, regardless of the RPS goal set, uh, regardless of the RPS goal chosen. And uh, it's followed by the value stack. Value stack is uh, second highest, and the uh, net meter is the, the achieve the least value of the social welfare. And um, another interesting point here is that like you see a slight increase in the social welfare from the 40% to the 50%. However, it, this, it uh, started to decrease to a lower value for the 60% and 70% RPS goal, which means uh, for this particular test system, like 50% RPS goal achieves the highest um, global social welfare. Um, and this is this is um, dominantly dominant, dominated by the fact that, like again, like uh, for the more aggressive RES goal, like you need to have a higher RES incentive to compensate such high capital cost of the RES incentives, and because of that, uh, the welfare has been decreased because of uh, because of by that. All right, and. All right, so the previous result was the case of the when you have the old information and the old uh, perfect foresight. Let's now move on to the comparison between the perfect foresight case and the imperfect foresight case. For imperfect foresight case. In case of the imperfect for foresight case, we developed the three, uh, we used the three different scenarios where there's a low, medium, high um, information, the foresight inaccuracy. The, in case of the low, like uh, the standard deviation of the random variable is set as a 5% of the average value and 10%, 50%. So essentially the high scenario means there will be a higher inaccuracy in your forecast. And the, what, what this table shows is the um, global social welfare. So first of all, um, the trend remains the same. Right, the DLMP achieves the highest um, global social welfare, followed by the value stack and net metering. And we didn't implement the information, I mean, like the imperfect uh, foresight for the net metering because it's quite obvious, right? In case of the net metering, you know how much is going to be charged, so there will be no um, inaccurate information about it. Um, however, in case of the value stack and DLMP, uh, as the information, I mean, like the, the forecast imperfect forecast, the amount of imperfect forecast increases, the social welfare gets diminished because of this inaccuracy. And uh, this trend is more or less the same uh, for the both the value stack and DLMP. Um, another interesting point we can observe here is that even in case of the high um, inf inaccurate information, still this value is higher than, than the value stack value. I mean, they can potentially, this can potentially mean the DLMP, DLMP based approach might be the best policy among those three, even accounting for this um, inf imperfect information situation, um, at least for this test system. Right. Okay, this is another table uh, which shows the, the total revenue and RS incentive of the strategic resource investor. What you can see here is that. Uh, even though they make more or less the same investment decisions across the order perfect and imperfect uh, foresight models, um, the in case of the imperfect, infer, imperfect case, they tend to secure more RES incentives, meaning they are not going to make investment decisions um, until they secure enough money to compensate this uncertainty in case of the imperfect foresight from the strategic resource investors, investors perspective. Like again, this trends remain the same, uh, while the total revenue from the both market T and D markets are more or less um, more or less the same for the medium and high. And in case of the low, actually they secure the more benefit here. So that was the case study, and here's my conclusion. Um, right. Yeah, so I studied the effects of the information problem and among the three policies I, I studied, like the LMP showed the, showed the greatest social welfare value. And compared to the perfect uh, foresight model, the social welfare is diminishing in case of the imperfect foresight model. And of course, if you have a higher inaccuracy in, inform in this information, your social welfare will be more diminished. And the computational performance was, even though I didn't present the algorithm precisely, the, they managed to obtain the 
the solution every single time I ran exact uh, and uh, and the multi level structure were successfully solved by using the those like uh, reformation techniques and algorithm enhancements. Right, that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you uh, very much for, uh, for this um, very detailed presentation. Uh, is there questions or comments coming from the audience? Okay, uh, I think the main reason uh, that explained that you, we have problems for commenting your, your work is uh, that there was too much. You give us um, three or four or five years of um, research uh, in, uh, in 20 minutes, which is uh, very impressive, but uh, there is so much information that nobody can um, uh, absorb it uh, and try to, to comment it in, in real time. So, um, so there is two options for the next presentation. Um, or you send us the PhD and we have time to read it and to comment chapter per chapter. Uh, or you do only uh, a quarter of your PhD and you invite us uh, with more details to interact on one precise question. Otherwise, it's uh, it's too complex. I, I don't know which piece of the work I could comment it uh, okay. or I could comment in uh, because it was something like a, an impressive uh, collection of work in which you, you master what you present. So it was clear and, uh, and elegant. So um, the only thing we could say is congratulations and, uh, and welcome in this community where you have your... Uh, your place without any doubt, but you should give it for the next time, give us less information because frankly, it was more a PhD defense. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> surprisingly, like uh, the all, all the pieces that I presented today is actually a one publication. Like it's just the model complexity. Like, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. It, I didn't the, 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 the complexity is so high that um, uh, it, it was at least too high for me. So, I uh, so I, I, I did not get where I could enter in and, and comment, but uh, it does not mean that the, the, the presentation is not good. I'm saying it's right. so good, but I have no comments, in fact. Okay. Thank you. Unless there is uh, someone um, having a, a point to, to raise, uh, I, I propose that we move to the last uh, presentation of uh, this session and um, we will uh, after close the um, uh, parallel session time. So please, uh, uh, George, I think it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Can you see now my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Moncada. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at KU Leuven. I would like to thank the organizers of the first uh, online conference for the opportunity of speaking today. In this presentation, uh, I will show how distribute uh, how <clears throat> distribution tariff structures and peer effects influence the adoption of distributed energy resources. I have divided the presentation in six parts. So in the introduction, I will provide uh, a background and explain what the problem is that we want to, to understand and to solve. Then uh, I will describe the, what are the main research questions and the contribution of this work. And then I will dive into the theories that we use to conceptualize the system and also the modeling paradigm that we use to formalize it. I will discuss some of the results, some of the main observations. Uh, and then I will draw some conclusions from, from that uh, results. And finally, I will conclude with uh, some recommendations for future work. 
So energy systems around the world are undergoing significant change. And this change is driven by advances in electricity generation and storage technology, and also for advances in information and communication technology. These changes is really creating a structural shift in how the power system is operated and planned. One example of this uh, structural shift is the emergence of prosumers. Prosumers are consumers that besides consuming energy or electricity, they are also able to produce it. And this emergence of prosumer also raises a share of challenges that cut across different dimensions. For instance, in the institutional dimension, we have uh, what is known as the utility debt spiral. That is basically a reinforcing feedback loop, something like this, something like uh, if there is an increase in the distribution cost that will lead to more uh, adoption of PV. And this adoption of PV will be translated in less use of the grid. And therefore the distributor system operator has to upgrade or has to increase the distribution cost. And this, this, uh, this increase in the distribution cost will again incentivize more adoption of PV. Another problem uh, with the emergence of prosumers is the, the usual economic uh, models to, to predict their behavior are not so adequate to represent their decision making. For prosumers, it's not only about economic gains, it's not only about profitability, but also about values, about environmental concerns, about what other people might think about them. So in this study, we want to understand how uh, different distribution tariff structures uh, uh, influence the utility debt spiral when the prosumer, the consumer uh, is not only an economic rational agent, but also takes into account all their non-economic factors. So the research question that we aim to answer is what is the influence of PR effects and distribution tariff structures on the adoption of integrated photovoltaic and battery energy storage systems, as well on the utility debt spiral. So the contribution that uh, we made is twofold. So we, we have a, a novel modeling framework that incorporates uh, social and attitudinal components into how uh, residential consumers make decisions as to the adoption of distributed energy resources. The other contribution in the modeling framework is that we also take into account the interplay between the adoption of distributed energy resources and the evolution of the distribution tariff. I also should clarify that uh, what I mean with PR effects is how it's, it's, a certain, it's a sort of social pressure, how people around you, how your neighbors might influence your behavior in, in certain direction. In this case, in adopting uh, solar PV panels or battery energy storage systems. Okay, uh, to, to address this problem, uh, we conceptualize the system from the perspective of a regulator. So this is our problem owner. Uh, from, from this perspective, we assume that he would like to understand how different distribution tariff structures, so volumetric tariff structures, capacity tariff structures, influence the deployment of solar panels, batteries, and also the utility debt spiral. We also assume that the system consists of two main agents. So we have the consumers, and these consumers live or interact to, through a social network. So in this case, the interaction is mainly due to PR effects, but also they interact with the DSO through the consumption patterns. These also uh, consumers, they also interact with technology, with the physical network. So they, they can adopt and operate solar panels, um, batteries, and so on. 
we assume that the dynamics that is going on in here is shaped by some external factors. In this case, it's, it's more about the solar and battery cost, the wholesale electricity prices, and the electric load. Now, to describe some processes, some actions that happen inside the, the model, the system, we are going to use some uh, theories for that. So the first theory is the theory of planet behavior. And we use, I will explain this later, uh, but we use this theory to basically model the decision making. And we use the diffusion of innovation theory to kind of classify the households in different types of adopters. We formalize these theories using an agent-based modeling paradigm. So let's talk about the theory of planning behavior. This theory is from psychology. And basically uh, what it, it says is that any behavior is driven by three factors. The attitude towards the behavior, the subjective norm, and the perceived behavioral control. Now, these terms are a bit abstract. So let me help you to understand them with a concrete example. So let's imagine that we want to adopt PV or to model the adoption of solar PV panels. So the attitude towards the behavior will be the profitability of my investment. It could be the MPV or a payback period calculation, for instance. The subjective norm is more about the, the pressure or the influence that other people uh, will have on my decision. In, in, in the case of solar PV panels, it has been observed that people who live in neighborhoods that many of the, of the neighbors are adopting PV are more likely to adopt PV because there is uh, a sort of peer pressure. So this is the subjective norm. And the perceived behavioral control is to account for the fact that even I want to invest in my solar PV panels because I can recover my investment in six, seven years, for instance, and everyone around me is adopting PV, but, but I don't have the resources, I don't have the income of, or, or the, of I don't own the household, the house, sorry, then uh, you will not engage in the adoption. As I said before, the diffusion of innovation theory, we use it to basically classify the different households and different type of adopters. So we have the innovators, we have early adopters, early majority, late majority and laggers. So innovators is basically people who are really prone to adopt new technology. They want to, as the name say, they want to innovate, they want to, they are really risk takers. Whereas the laggers, they are more risk averse. They wait until almost everyone uh, uh, has adopted the technology to adopt it. So they really rely a lot on, on the social uh, uh, or the peer uh, effect part. So now, uh, as I mentioned before, we use these theories to describe certain processes or certain aspects, concepts of the model conceptualization. And then they were formalized in an agent-based model. So for those who are not too familiar with agent-based modeling, so let me give you a brief explanation about what agent-based modeling is. Uh, I would like to give this explanation, maybe uh, comparing agent-based modeling with there's a two main string approaches in energy system that is optimization and equilibrium models. So we can uh, classify models in general, I think in two groups. So uh, models that really provide a prescription of, of, or a normative vision of the system. So this is mainly optimization uh, models. And the, 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 the modeling question that these models uh, aim to answer is basically how should the system uh, evolve or be operated? This is mainly the, so it's very normative. In the other stream, 
we have the, the scripting model. So the idea is to basically describe the system, how it is, not how it should be. So basically the modeling question is, is about how the system evolve of, or is operated. And in this uh, type of model, we have equilibrium models on one hand, and the other hand, the agent-based models. So agent-based model is a, is a simulation model. Is a bottom-up also approach. So uh, we model the system or we uh, characterize the system in terms of agents and how they interact. And the interaction so with, among these agents produces the behavior that we see at the system level. So this is the idea. One of the advantages of uh, using agent-based modeling is that we can incorporate processes or concepts that are maybe difficult to incorporate in equilibrium models and optimization models because of the mathematical tractability. That was one of the reasons that we decided to, to use this approach. Okay, uh, as I said before, agent-based modeling is a simulation approach. Uh, that means that the agents in the, in the, in the model they engage in certain actions, right? So we have two main uh, agents in the, in, the, in the model. We have the households and the DSO. And the household, they have two states. They can, be, they can be either consumer or prosumer. And based on that state, they can engage in different actions. So for instance, the prosumer, uh, he will uh, recollect some information about costs and prices and demand profiles to operate in an optimal way uh, his distributed energy resources. Whereas the consumer will use that information to decide whether he is interested to adopt or not certain uh, distributed energy resources. The DSO is more concerned with the, to calculate how the, the grid is used, what is the total electricity flow. And based on this uh, figure to estimate how he should update the distribution tariff in order to recover the, their cost. So uh, we assume that these different processes take time uh, uh, in one tiny step, that is one year, and we repeat this cycle until we reach the temporal scope that is 20 years. And we uh, assume a time resolution of one hour. I also uh, must say that we represent every year using 12 representative days of 24 hours. Okay, uh, now let's dive into what I think is the core of the model. And it's basically how we model the investment decision-making, the adoption decision-making. So here, what I show is basically how we formalize the theory of planning behavior. And we uh, did it in, uh, let's say, in different stages. So the first stage is to verify whether the agent owns the house or not. So this is the approach for the perceived behavioral control. If he doesn't own the household, then the, the process of, uh, of the decision-making stops. If he owns the household, then uh, we will uh, use a total utility. We assume that every household has a total utility that consists of a utility describing of representing an economic uh, parameter and utility representing a not economic parameter. In this case, the SAPR effect. And, and these utilities has some weight allocated to them. And the, so for the attitude towards the behavior, we define a, a payback utility and we'll, we, kind of normalize it to be able to make this calculation. So these values are between zero and one. And the, the intuition here is the highest the payback period, 
the lower is the this utility and and then the lower is the incentive to invest in that technology from an economic perspective. Then another concept that we introduced for the subjective norm, this is more the PR effect. Uh, here, I think it's a bit misleading. It should be like a PR effect utility instead of a social utility. And the idea is that we create some kind of neighborhood. So we assume that the agents, the households, in the model, they are surrounded by other people, by other neighbors. So this is the number of households. And then the number of prosumer is the number of people in my neighborhood who are adopting, uh, who is adopting solar PV or batteries. So the higher is the number of prosumers in my neighborhood, the higher is this utility, the closest to one, and the higher is going to be this total utility. So with these two parameters, calculated, I can calculate a total utility. And then I compare, the edges compare the total utility with a threshold. And this threshold is given based on the type of adopter. So for instance, if you are an innovator, your threshold to adopt is lower than the threshold for a lagger. So it's, it's to capture these differences between different types of adopters. So here is some of the data that we use in the, in the model. Uh, what I think is important here is again, how we allocate the values for the adoption threshold and for the weight given to the payback utility based on the type of adopter. So again, for instance, for innovator, the adoption threshold is much lower than for the laggards, just to represent that the innovator are more prone to, to adopt. And also, uh, the weight given to the to the payback is higher for an innovator than it will be for a lagger. A lagger also uh, put a lot of weight on the PR effect part. Okay, uh, now let's uh, dive into the results. So, given the the time constraints, I will be really brief. So, what you see here is the the evolution of cumulative in cell PV capacity under different distribution tariff structures under two scenarios. So one scenario is the blue one is when we assume that the households are economic rational. That means that they don't account for PR effects. They only look at the payback periods, for instance. And the red scenario is when the households account for PR effects and for the payback period when they uh, made uh, the investment decision making. So there are two observations in general. Uh, one of them is the adoption patterns of PV in this case, they are influenced by the different distribution tariff structures. The second observation is that the, when you neglect PR effects, the rate of uh, uh, adoption is higher than when you take into account PR effects in the decision making. This uh, observation or this result is the result of how we initialize the model because we assume that at the beginning, nobody has PV or battery. So that means that the utility, uh, the payback utility is very low and, and that will kind of hold back the, the rate of adoption in this scenario. Now, looking to the utility debt spiral. So what you see here is the distribution ratio define the distribution tariff to certain point in time divided by the initial uh, distribution tariff. That's why all of them start in one. So again, uh, to simplify, uh, let me give you two observations in general. So again, the, uh, the evolution of distribution tariff really uh, is influenced by the different distribution tariff structures. And the second one is that in the long term, the PR effects has no really significant influence on the utility that is spiral, as you can see. So let's recap. Uh, so first we develop 
an agent-based model to understand how peer effects and distribution tariff structures influence the adoption of distributed energy resources by households. We also saw that the, the PR effects are kind of limiting the rate of adoption uh, in this setting. And therefore, the, the, the suggestion is to create channels of communication to enhance this influence. And this channel communication might accelerate the adoption of distributed energy resources in the short term. And finally, we saw that distribution tariff structure can influence both the adoption of distributed energy resources and the utility debt spiral. Finally, I would like to conclude with some recommendations for future work. Uh, I think a uh, further step in this research will be to incorporate elements of risk, uh, of risk and loss aversion in investment decision making, maybe using uh, prospect theory, for instance. Also, in this model, we only capture one feedback loop of the whole uh, system. But there is another feedback loop that describes how uh, the wholesale pr electricity prices change or are shift driven by high TV penetration. So I think to develop a full picture of this distribution tariff spiral, we need to account for these two feedback loops. I hope uh, I have shed uh, some light on how PR effects and distribution tariff uh, structure influence the adoption of distributed energy resources. I will now be happy to take your questions. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Muy buena presentación. Muchas gracias. Uh, gracias. Uh, is there uh, questions coming from the audience first before I raise a couple of minds? I think Mohamed, you could work uh, with uh, with uh, Jorge to, um, to to see how you could combine uh, the two approaches because what roughly um, uh, you are doing, uh, Mohamed, could be a, a sort of uh, what is the rationale behind the learning process to get to the peer-to-peer? -peer? Uh, and why uh, 10, 20, 30 um, households uh, could manage to get uh, a peer-to-peer -peer framework to be adopted? Uh, so I see a, a, a strong potential interest uh, between the, the two of your presentations, in fact. Uh, which uh, comes to my main comment um, or the main, let's say, uh, trick I, I will propose you, uh, Jorge. I think with your presentation, you, you, the aim of the, your presentation is to explain um, how it can work. Uh, so it's a sort of uh, uh, these are the materials that will explain that we will reach the goal. But you could also do something which is more provocative, which is how a regulator could prevent peer-to-peer -peer communication to create the death spiral and to be more protective, which is the, what you say is how we go from zero to one. And what I'm telling you is you could also do something uh, one minus what you have. Uh, which could uh, could be funny also to to display as a, an anti manual uh, to, for regulators to prevent the entry of uh, technologies they think they are um, uh, but comes against their um, let's say traditional way of uh, of working. Uh, the the only um, the only interest of doing it uh, one minus uh, instead of uh, from zero to is to identify the threshold in which the, syst the system becomes uh, unstoppable. And uh, I think this limit uh, is something that would make sense in your, uh, in, in your work, Jorge. When do you get to the point that the snowball effects 
makes the regulator out of control. Like to identify the tipping point, right? Yeah. Something like that. In which, uh, if you don't want to have it, uh, if you reach this threshold whatsoever, you will do it too late. And you enter into a mess because if you don't know what to do or how to regulate, uh, maybe as a regulator, you want to, to, to keep the control of the innovation to a certain range in order to learn. And when you have all the components which comes, becomes clearer, you say, okay, now I could open the door to massive diffusion. But, uh, but I, I think with, um, with the revolution that comes with peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, one of the biggest problems for regulators will be to, 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 to learn how to let people learn without destroying everything. Because the potential of disruption is so high that uh, once people are equipped with uh, home batteries, uh, cars, electric cars, and uh, uh, the home uh, the management system that presented Mohamed, uh, what is the role of the network? Uh, to provide you electricity a couple of hours per year when your own production, your own reserves are not enough. Uh, <clears throat> it was strange to invest billions in networks uh, just to provide uh, security for uh, some couple of hours in the year. Yeah, how you require the cost? Yeah. Yeah. So, and and in in which moment you you allow innovation? In which moment you destroy your uh, and you create a massive sunk cost of uh, useless cables? Or cables which are useful, uh, I don't know, um, 200 hours per year. And uh, what is the what is the economic value of uh, a cable if it delivers only uh, 200 uh, hours of electricity per year? So I I would say that you could play with the the, the two of you. Uh, you could play to. Um, to, to, to try to define this, uh, um, this loss of control on the network, on a small network, uh, and then to try to expand it uh, with, um, with your model, Georgie, to, to, to the point in which uh, this loss of control, if it's just a branch of a DSO, it's not too important, uh, even if it has consequences for DSO, but if it generalizes, uh, through the diffusion channels that you are um, uh, that you are explaining, and it has a viral effect. Then, how do we stop the virus? Oh, thanks. I think there are, yeah, nice remarks. Uh, yeah, I will keep uh, stay in touch with Mohammed, so maybe we can collaborate in the future. Yeah, of course. Because indeed, in my model, I don't take into account the grid. I assume that the grid is there and will, so there is no congestion or this kind of problems, for instance. Because you, you need the, the block of, uh, of models that Mohamed can, uh, can plug to your, uh, to, to your logical um, research on the, what is the moment in which something is happening. And you exactly. could have not just to say, okay, there is no network problem, but you, you could go down to, this is how it works on the network. And this is the moment in which the networks are in such a shape that it allows the diffusion because it works, because the network sees that it works. So it's not far from your place. It's just your neighbors. Indeed, no, I think it's a very good idea. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, is there other questions or comments? I think we are all uh, exhausted after uh, three days and uh, 12 hours per day of session. So maybe it's time to, to close this one and to, uh, to thank the, um, uh, the, the, the four speakers for their very interesting presentations. Uh, frankly, it was a pleasure to, to, to listen to them and to try to 
to interact with you. Uh, I hope we can uh, we can go on that uh, on that direction. And just to let you know that there is a final firework session uh, for EIE that starts at uh, at seven uh, to nine uh, uh, p.m. Uh, French time, in which you will have. Um, a lot of insights from very high level experts. So if you have uh, time, don't, don't hesitate to join us in these final sessions. So I wish you the best and uh, see you um, maybe in live somewhere, <laughs> somehow. Bye all, thank you very much. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you.